as I told some of the students before everyone arrived, is that, yeah, I used to do a lot of good work. Now all I do is give seminars. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and, and hopefully maybe good ones. We'll see. I'm going to give an overview so that I'm not going to der derive any equations. Well, maybe a couple, but, but really simple derivations. And, and I'm just going to give you the essence of shockwave physics. And uh, there's a lot more to it. And as Peter mentioned, if you really want to get into it, I wrote a book. Yeah. It took me three years. And uh, as I told the students, and I get $10 a book, if so, so go ahead and buy it. <laughs> I might get a lunch or something out of it. <laughs> but I didn't write it for the money, obviously. Uh, and actually, the truth is I'm proud of the book because there was no textbook in this field, even though there's lots of famous scientists working in the field, even back from the Los Alamos days. So I'm going to go ahead and, and go through the basics of, of uh, shockwave physics. And uh, it's, it's an eclectic field in that it's, it's not just physics, really. It, it, the field's made up of all the disciplines, uh, hydrodynamics, thermodynamics, solid state physics, chemistry, quantum mechanics. And so it really brings a lot of information together when you get into uh, some of the advanced uh, subjects. And so uh, this, this scares some people, and it takes a while to get used to the fact that you, you're going to be dealing, depending on your uh, funding agency, uh, on different things in the field. And Washington State was the major shock uh, wave uh, institute in the U.S. And back in the 1960s. And so uh, it turns out that uh, George Duvall was, one, uh, was a pioneer in that field. And uh, I decided after getting my master's here at Maryland, I would go uh, get a Ph.D. with George Duvall at Washington State. So, so I did that. And... Uh, there's only a few, a few, only a few schools that really teach shockwave physics. Uh, th there are some smaller programs, Caltech, Georgia Tech, U uh, University of Maryland. Uh, and so there are some subjects uh, or some schools that do teach this subject, but uh, Washington State still produces PhDs uh, in this field. And I think Caltech does too now. It didn't used to, but it does now. Now, the current areas of interest is time-resolved spectroscopy, and we're talking microsecond re resolution or nanosecond resolution, uh, determined when benzene molecules dissociate, and also how c the chromium impurity atom moves relative to the r ruby lattice when you shock it. And these are the things that, we, that were determined by the spectroscopy. We do a lot on phase transformations if they're fast enough. In fact, my PhD was on the phase transition of iron, uh, alpha to epsilon, uh, uh, under shock loading. And if, if the phase transition takes too much time, you don't see it in a shock wave. So I'll just tell you that. So the, shock wave, the transformation on phase transitions that we see in shockwave physics happens extremely fast, uh, supersonic. Uh, velocities. Uh, in this field, you have uh, extreme high pressures, but for short times. So you can get to uh, pressures more than the center of the earth and, and, and it's like megabars, but you can only keep it up for a fraction of a microsecond. So you've got to learn how to do your experiments very fast. Uh, also, uh, areas of research is molecular dynamics condensed matter high pressure phys uh, chemistry, because, uh, in fact, I'll show you a slide on that. It's called explosives and detonating explosives. And that's chemistry, but uh, you'll see that it gives very high pressure. Planetary physics, geophysics, warm dense matter, material strength at high pressure, ramp wave loading, which is not a shock wave. That just means that you uh, slowly uh, pressure rise the sample. And that gives you more of an isentrope. And I'll get into a little bit of the thermodynamics later. And there's medical applications. Essentially, what would that be? Breaking up stones in your kidneys with sonic shock waves. So uh, just when I first saw this, I, I haven't given this talk for a while. I was thought of, well, what is that application? I couldn't remember it. Then I did. <laughs> so 
Well, solids under these kind of pressures flow like fluids, and that's sort of somewhat hard to sort of think about. Uh, and so it, it's a uh, way to study the condensed matter at high pressures and compressions. And I mentioned here that uh, we, we can get up to this kind of pressure without any problem, but it doesn't last very long. It's only, it's only a few millionths of a, a second, a microsecond. So to get you familiar with the type of uh, units to, that are consistent for what we do uh, in this field, the time is usually reported in, it's in microseconds, the velocity is in centimeters a microsecond, pressures in megabars, these are consistent units, which means when you use the simple equations, which I'll show you, uh, if you use the un these units, you get the right answer. So uh, energy in megabars per centimeters cube, and one megabar per centimeter cube is, worth, is equal to 10 to the fifth joules, which is a lot of energy. So, and now the simplest conditions, the simplest conditions is conducting basic research in, uh, is the material properties. The shock wave fronts discussed here are one dimensional semi-infinite planes, which means the compression is in one direction only, and material does not move laterally. And if you can do that, and I'll show you how you do that, it's not that hard, uh, then you simplify a lot of the equations and can get a lot of answers on material properties uh, with a shock wave. We consider at high pressures that the uh, materials are fluid continuums where uh, each part is the same as the other relative element. And even a material like um, iron has a lot of little grains, but if you use the, uh, an element of measuring the pressure that goes over many of those grains, the, the average then is what you measure. And that, you would consider that a continuum. So, uh, shock materials are at the thermodynamic equilibrium unless stated. Uh, in this talk, and, and I'll uh, show you that there are some conditions at the end that they are not in thermodynamic conditions, and what happens when that is the case. And we do reference the, uh, we use a reference as a Eulerian reference, which is like putting the, the uh, uh, corner of the room as your, as your uh, uh, Eulerian coordinates. And there, are, there is a Lagrange coordinates, but I'm not going to get into that. That's another area that if you're, special, you're doing the work in the field or do a, a code, you might want to use it. But just for this talk, we're just talking the normal uh, Eulerian coordinates. Well, what is one-dimensional strain? Uh, it's a continuum material. Well, like I said before, you, you you have all the compression in one direction, like say the X direction, and the, there is no uh, flow in, in where, you look, where your gauge is in the X, or I mean the Y or Z, and so it's one dimensional compression. And that simplifies things as, as you'll see very shortly. Uh, it's a continuum, and I mentioned this before, material so that every element is large enough so that the average is, is a continuum. You don't have to really consider the internal structure. Now there are other experiments where you do that, in like crystals, but for this talk I'm only talking about continuums. Okay, here's a one-dimensional shock wave. And notice that this is a PX this would be the shock front, and then it is at a, this is a one-dimensional shock front, and it's the same pressure for a, a distance, or this would be the same as time, as, as it turns out. And then there's a wave behind it that's called a rarefaction wave, because you can't sustain such high pressure on a material for very long. And so it's uh, a, a, due to a boundary that, that uh, the, the shock wave reaches, uh, it, it reflects and, and starts bringing the pressure down. And it's called a rarefaction wave, and it actually is faster than the shock front. And in fact, its velocity 
is U plus C, which is greater than the shock front. So what that means is that if you uh, have a flash x-ray and you shock the material and you see this profile, at a later time, this uh, part of the wave is over here and comes down. And eventually, it eliminates the shock front. So you got to do the experiment that you're going to look at and get the data from before this rarefaction wave wipes out the, the shock front. So that's one of the considerations if you're designing your experiments you have to worry about. Uh, in, in reality, this is not uh, infinite rise. It actually has a rise time due to either viscosity or uh, it's very short, but it, but it is uh, in the, maybe the picosecond uh, type uh, time frames, whereas the, uh, this is a, uh, about a microsecond uh, wave, uh, so it, it will have a rise time. And in fact, later I'll p mention that you may have more than one wave for different uh, conditions. Okay. Uh, Again, the point really is that you have to do your measurements before this rarefaction wipes out the shock front. So that's a limitation, but uh, one can really live with that. It's, it's um, important to understand that shock velocity, particle velocity, internal energy for a steady wave in laboratory coordinates. So. The reason I say this is you're going to see some simple equations with these parameters in them. It's called the jump equations, which is really the conservation of momentum, energy, and, and uh, mass, as a matter of fact. It's just the conservation laws, but you've probably not seen them in this form before unless you've been in this field. So the shock wave velocity is probably the easiest thing to visualize. It's just the velocity of a wave through a sample. Now, it's going to be supersonic, actually, it, but it's still just the wave velocity. And it's, you know, the thickness divided by the transit time is its velocity. So that's simple. The uh, particle velocity, the, you, uh, and we you will use, uh, U sub P, little U sub P is, is a particle motion. And that's something that you're not used to, you, you might be used to it, but you don't realize it, is uh, that that's the motion of the mass behind the shock front. Because if you think, first if you're thinking that first it's a solid in rest, and the shock hits it, then the mass points move af be af behind the shock front. And that's the particle velocity. And one way I found that it was a little bit easier for you to understand if you ever go body surfing at, say, the ocean, you know, the, the wave goes over past you, but then as you're in the wave, you still go towards the shore just at a very slower pace. That's particle motion. And now, of course, in the ocean, the wave hits the shore and comes back, but we're, we're just talking about just after the wave front. Uh, the ocean wavefront goes over, you'll notice that you're, you still go towards the shore just at a slow pace. You don't stay where you were. Well, that is particle motion because that's what the particle mo of the ocean water is, is going towards the shore. And then, of course, it reflects off the beach and pushes it back. But that's uh, by then the experiment's over. <laughs> We've already done our experiment. Yes? Or because it seems like the particles would slow down due to you know, viscosity drag. And the, it, the viscosity drag is so small compared to the shock pressure that it doesn't affect it very much. Uh, internal energy is relative to initial state. This is, you know, just thermal and mechanical energy. So if you shock something, you put energy in it, and it could be, it's usually hot if you pick it up. In fact, uh, you don't want to do that because it can, I speak from experience, I did that once on an experiment and burnt my fingers, so uh, it was very hot. It was a piece of brass, actually. And it um, turns out that uh, 
So there is, there is thermal and work done. And that's just sort of, that's typical thermodynamics. I, there's nothing particularly new there. Now, I got a, this is the one derivation. The shock wave uh, equations for one dimensional shock waves are extremely well known and they're very simple. And that's why the shock wave field uh, sometimes sets the st pressure standards in, in the field, because the simple equations are fairly a are accurate. Whereas if you do, a, for example, a static press, you get way above the yield point of the material in the press, it's no longer that accurate, unless you have something in the sample that you're, like a ruby, that you're t uh, looking at. So this, this is probably one of the big contributions of the shockwave field is that it actually sets the standard and, and the equation of state for high pressure. So to do that, I want to show you that it really is simple. If you take, and it, remember this is a one-dimensional shock, and I, I can take a tube and I can take a, a cross-section out of that, and this would be the shock wave. And just conservation of mass is the mass on, on the, uh, this side, rho naught u delta t, and behind the shock, because that particle velocity is moving, remember the, uh, the particle velocity behind the shock is not zero, here it is. And therefore, if you take the, and the density has changed also. So the density times u minus u delta t, that gives you the conservation of mass. You can also continue to argue that, okay, conservation of momentum is just, you know, force times the area. This would be the uh, F equal ma, and that comes out rho naught u, little u, the area. And the conservation of energy is just one half the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And, and again, I'm not trying to derive these for you, uh, except to show you that it's simple because this is what the equations wind up being, and this is what made the fields so attractive to Los Alamos way back when they started the field, is that these are, are very accurate equations, and uh, this is just the density, initial density over the fi final density, which is in a shock wave. This is behind the shock front, remember. This, this is what we're talking about. This is the shock velocity minus the particle velocity over the shock velocity. That's your conservation of mass. And so that's the first equation. The second equation, which comes out of what I showed you on the previous slide, is just the pressure is equal to the initial density times the shock velocity times the particle velocity. So essentially, you just need to measure two things in a shock experiment that's one dimensional. It's usually the shock velocity and the particle velocity is what you measure. But if, if you have a gauge, and I'm going to show you what a Mangannon gauge is, a pressure gauge, you could also choose uh, pressure and shock velocity. Always measure shock velocity. That's the simplest measurement you can make. So um, E is the Rankine-Hugoni relation, and it's tied to thermodynamics. Uh, the most common parameters are US and UP. I said this before, but occasionally you can measure P if you have a gauge, a correct gauge. So you just need to measure, the point really is you just need to measure two quantities and you can get the pressure, the, the compression, and the to energy that uh, you put into the sample. So if you're doing high pressure material science, th these are important things that you wanna know because uh, it follows thermodynamics. We're assuming that this, this, everything's in equilibrium here. Let's see, and the units, it's just that I, I put these consistent units in because this can be a problem if you look at the literature because even though I tell you that shock velocity, consistent units is in centimeters per microsecond, most people in the literature report it in millimeter microsecond because it comes out as a single number like 5.0 or something. So I just point that out. But So you need to use uh, consistent units if you're going to uh, uh, use these equations. So I, I can't impress upon you more that these are very simple equations. So if you can do an experiment, then you have a, a very good thermodynamic uh, Hugonio. It's not an adiabat, it is 
is a, or an isentrope, it's a eugonio, and that's because there's entropy across that shock front. It it's, does create entropy. That's the only difference between it and an isentrope, as a matter of fact. So, in fact, here's, if you look, wanting to look at a PVT plane, and again, we're assuming therm, uh, that it is in equilibrium, uh, this shows you the isotherm, of course, is on this plane. Uh, this would be the isentrope, but the Higonio is further in uh, because of this, a little bit of entropy that is developed across the shock front. So the isentrope and, and the Higonio, uh, I've drawn it here showing it is quite a distance apart. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's not that far apart, but just for graphic uh, reasons, I did draw it that way. So, so that you know they're not the same. You, you really have to uh, correct for the entropy. Right. It, it turns out that the, the, the Hugonio is the shock PV curve, whereas the isentrope, you know, you, you, is on the plane, but the, uh, the Hugonio is, is dis defined by the shock wave and uh, it, and I'm showing that they, they, the isentrope and the eugonio are not the same, and they will give different curves. So, so, so in other words, uh, entropy is created? Yes, across that front. Uh, not in the material afterwards, but just across the, sh the it's a discontinuity, and it, that cre that's creates entropy. Uh, here's some typical magnitudes of a shock wave for may, maybe a metal because you know th there's whole uh, volumes of data on shock waves so I I just wanted to pick a typical thing and so a density you know a five five grams per centimeter just as tip that's just a typical one yeah the point the, the, the this is a typical shock velocity in a metal. And it doesn't mean that's what it'll always be. It's just, I'm just trying to give you orders of magnitude here. And so a half a centimeter a microsecond, that, that would be a typical shock in a, in a metal uh, at a certain pressure, but at which I didn't want to uh, complicate the matter. But a wave transit time in a, say, a two and a half centimeter sample then, for that shock velocity would be five microseconds. So again, everything's happening fairly fast. Uh, particle velocities are actually even slower. Like the particle velocity in a material like that will be in the range of 0.1 centimeter a microsecond, which is like essentially an order of magnitude lower than the shock velocity, uh, just to give you a feel for it. And the internal energy is like 0.005. Remember, uh, that's, that's still a lot of energy because that would be like five times 10 to the three joules. So still a lot of energy. Okay, an excellent way to create a 1D shock wave is a, is a smooth gas bore gun. And a smooth bore gun uh, in an in a artillery gun you actually get it so that it spins the, the, the shell. In this research, it's a smooth bore so that it does, the projectile does not rotate. It just comes down and it's a flat plate hitting a flat plate. That's how you actually do a one-dimensional shock. And so uh, you can go up to velocities really high, you know. Uh, Livermore had a gun that uh, would, would run up to, you know, maybe, I forget, something like 10 millimeter microsecond or so, very high. Uh, this would be what the, some a facility like this would look like. Actually, Indian Head has given me permission to show this. This is what Indian Head's gas gun looks like. Uh, it's, you, you actually have a pressure breach here, and then a long, uh, if you notice, this is a long tube, and then back here, which is not coming out too well, is a, a vacuum tank. And on the end of the barrel is a flat plate. So what we're doing is sending a projectile that's flat-ended 
all the way down so that it will be not accelerating. It'll be at a certain velocity, by the, a steady velocity by the time it reaches down here to the target. And when it impacts, then you have created a one-dimensional shock wave. <clears throat> and this type of research has gone on in many laboratories, uh, Indian Head, Livermore, Los Alamos, ARL. Uh, so this, this is one of the best ways to do this shockwave work, is to use a facility like this. The other way is explosives, but I'm not going to get into that too much. So, uh, so this, is, this is sort of what happens at the end of the gun. This is the, uh, obviously this is the projectile, and you can put different materials, and usually you try to match this material with the, uh, the cover plate material. This is the projectile coming down, and this is the target that was in that big tank that I showed you. But on this, you can put gauges and it, at different Lagrange positions. And those gauges, in this case, would be Mangannon gauges, which means they, they measure pressure. Essentially, they change resistance, and you put a constant current through it, and therefore you can get the actual profile of the resistance of, of that uh, wire or gauge as the shock wave goes through it. Now, these crystal pins here, we, we want to know what the velocity of the projectile is. So if you just have these at different impacts, and there's more than two usually, you know, here you know the distance between these ten, pins, you get it on your oscilloscope, you have a delta T, you know the distance, you know the velocity then very accurately of that projectile impacting the sample. Uh, this is one of the better experiments you can do with a gas gun, and uh, all laboratories actually do this kind of work now. <clears throat> When I started, we were just using explosive drivers, so. This is, Jerry, yes, are yes. Are all please. elements of the target destroyed, including the velocity pins? Yes. That's one thing you have to get used to, is that uh, you, can re you, rec you recover little fragments and sort through them, but that's, you never can do the, use the same targets twice. It, everything is destroyed, yeah. So anyhow, since we, we can get this velocity, when you have a target like this, we know that this, the distance is between the gauges, and we're gonna see the, uh, the, that on a oscilloscope. So we know the distance and we know the time, so we have actually a little bit of the, shot, of the velocity of the wave going through. And these gauges, one type of gauge that we use is called a Mangannon gauge, and it's a four lead gauge because it's, uh, you don't want any contact resistance. And I, I'm assuming everyone knows that if you want, don't want contact resistance, you have to have four leads, uh, two for current, two for voltage. If you just you have two, you have contact resistance and you, you, you will not get the answer you want, especially if the re resistance of the gauge is low. The truth is these, this is the only, this is the pressure element. All the rest of these are the voltage that these are the voltage output, and here's, you put the current, a constant current through uh, these two leads. But the, the, this is really the only element that, that you're looking at uh, that will change in, uh, with the pressure when you compress it. And when that pressure compresses it, then this gauge has been calibrated. So that when you see what the resistance is, you know what the pressure is. So. Here's a typical, well, this is an ideal. <laughs> My gauges never looked, records ever looked this good, but, uh, but this, the ideal would be is at first, you have a step, you have to put the voltage on the gauge and, and the current through the gauge before the shock hits it, so it, everything's steady. And so here's your initial voltage, and then the shock wave hits it, and that changes the resistance of the gauge, and so it goes up and I use a fairly long rise time, that's just for artistic reasons. And the measurement here between this and here is going to give you the pressure that is in that sample for this particular gauge. And because it's calibrated that's, uh, for that. Uh, so now that's probably about a week's 
shockwave lectures that you just heard in the last two slides. So excuse me for going so fast. I'm trying to give the overview. And, and so the, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about, that was the gauges, how you could use a gauge. There's, there's more than one gauge, of course, and I, I don't have time to go through a lot of those. If it was something we were specially looking at for, say, a phase transition, then I could talk more about it. But this is an overview. So what I have here is that you can get more than one shock wave in a material. If it has no phase transitions or elastic limits, it's usually just one, just like this. And it, the Rayleigh line defines the shock. And it goes, it just means it's a straight line up to from the initial state to the pressure. And that gives you a single point. You get one, you get that point with one experiment right here. Now, what if the material has a Hugo elastic limit? And in shock waves, that's called a Hugonial elastic limit. And that's this one. So maybe it'll go up to, like iron, it'll go up to 12 kilobars and then it'll yield. And that's what this would be. This would be 12 kilobars if this is iron. And then it, it yields. But that means there's two waves. The first wave, because any break in this Rayleigh line means there's more than one wave. And in fact, two, uh, this one break means there's two waves. There's the elastic wave, which is going to be faster than the plastic wave which goes from the elastic limit to the final pressure. So you actually see on your oscilloscope or your camera two waves. And therefore, if you do enough experiments, you can define this curve. And that's what we do. We do multiple experiments. And this usually stays constant, the elastic limit. And then we can generate this Hugonio and publish a paper and hopefully get a promotion. So, uh, and and the, this one would be iron, for example. Iron has elastic limit, it has a phase transition, and this is what I studied. Essentially, you have this Hugonio elastic limit, then you have the phase transition, which is 130 kilobars, and uh, which is pretty close to the static. And in fact, this field sort of started with the iron stuff, and that Bridgman and them had the wrong pressures for the iron because the press starts at 130 kilobars, the press gives. And so the shockwave people uh, published a paper on iron and said, well, uh, we disagree with Bridgman. But Bridgman by then, you know, was a Nobel Prize winner and you must really have your ducks in order to, if you're going to disagree with Bridgman. And f he finally conceded and, and did, well, he went back and did more experiments and found that his press was giving, uh, the materials were, were uh, expanding, which he, he had not corrected for. And, and that's, that's in the literature, of course, especially in the shockwave literature. That's really in, <laughs> where you can read that mostly. But anyhow, so for shockwaves, we don't have to worry, like the static people have to worry if you go very high pressures, like if we're up at half a megabore or a megabore. The static people can do it, but they do it with, they let the press go ahead and give way. They put a ruby crystal in it, and then they watch the fluorescent. And without going through the details, you, can, you have a pressure measurement from that fluorescence. And therefore, you know what's in the center of your cell. Even if the cell has uh, changed a little bit, you still accurately know what's in it because of that fluorescence. So that took a while for that to uh, come about where the two fields then started agreeing with the, with the answers. Yeah, this is pressure volume. There, there'd be three waves in this experiment that you would actually see then they're separated. And the first one is faster, but it's only about say 12 kilobars. This one would be 130 kilobars. Uh, follow, it'd be a shock wave following this first one. And then there's a third shock wave to the final state. Ideally, it would look like three steps. Yeah, it's like three stair steps uh, if you want to visualize it in a very ideal form. They would, and all, initially, all, it, it, as Bill said, that you'd think of this as all three waves start right at this interface at that pressure, but they're different velocities. So they separate as they go across. Oh, 
you know, uh, the truth is it takes a little time to form them. But that, that's, but the concept of them being three waves is, is pretty accurate, actually. And, but they're different velocities. But they all, you know, it's like three racers starting from the same yeah. point in different velocities. So, yeah. All right, I want to show you something that uh, Los Alamos let me uh, use. Actually show you an experiment where the way you can see the wave shock wave going through the sample. This is just a static one of it. This shows you this is where a flyer plate has hit another plate. You can see and they've done the uh, proton beam x-ray and so you can see the gradients here. And uh, so it's for years, you know, we just had to assume that this was happening, or, or we believed it, but the, with the proton photography, uh, it does show that it works. Now, I have to go over here to show you the movie. It takes a second. <laughs> and again, these are presented by, uh, in New Orleans by Paula Rigg, uh, who's this is again that same static. Now you'll see it as a dynamic uh, experiment. See the flyer plate hitting, and if you look, I, I don't know, could you see the gradient? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this just shows that uh, this is not just hand waving, it does, does really happen this way. Uh, I think that was cool, but uh, let me. Okay, up to now, I've all, uh, talked only about steady shock waves, which is what most of the field deals with. But uh, non-steady waves can exist. It just means that the kinetics might not be fast enough to be in equilibrium. And so I'll just go very briefly over uh, what some of this could mean. Again, the same experiment, but now I'm going to show you an initiating explosive with these kind of, so this is going to be an explosive, and it does not initiate right at the boundary, which you might think it does. It, do, it I mean, it does initiate, but it's, it's not at the final state. It has to release energy and build up. So an explosive, you, you can initiate for, with a shock pressure, but the explosive pressure is maybe four or five times what you put in it because of the chemical energy release. And... Usually I don't give this to university people, but it's too cool not to show you. <laughs> so this is the gauge record of a Mangana gauge in a sample. Uh, and this is actually one of my gauge records. <laughs> and this is really what the detonation wave, I, I just got it. So it was just at the end in this experiment. I published this, of course. This is what it would normally look like as a detonation wave. This is what that Mangannon gauge. So I caught, it was built, you can see that each gauge here, this is right at the interface, and it takes, okay, there's some energy hitting that gauge, but it takes uh, a few microseconds before it even builds up. But as, as it goes through the target, you can see that we're getting higher pressures until finally, I, I can't, I don't have the uh, second one, but this will always be the, look like this. If this was an, a sample, I had another gauge out here, it would look just like this one. It was now steady state. And so this is the buildup of a uh, initiating explosive. Uh, I'm not going to go over it too much, but so how do you handle a, a, a situation like that? I mean, that just it keeps changing in time, right? Well, you can do that, but it takes a differential conservation laws and a hydro code. I assume some, you've all heard of hydro codes, but also you have to have a material model, and that's where there's a lot of debate about it because uh, who knows how good a material model is? Except if you get a model, it can reproduce the data, and that's really what the field has done, but. It's not as accurate as if it was steady waves. One has to argue that your model is accurate is another way of saying it. Uh, in that case, remember the simple three little p equal rho u u? That no longer is valid. Here's the equations you gotta solve. So clearly, it's much more complicated. <laughs>
you got to do this numerically with a code. These are differential equations. And uh, if another quick point down here is if, if you are really good at math, if you just uh, let all the terms with respect to t go to zero, you come up with those jump equations where p equal rho u u, they fall right out of this. But I'm not going to do that today. It's just a case that uh, I, I did it graphically as a, as a tube conservation, but this is even more uh, uh, important way of getting the same equations by just letting the uh, time difference go to zero. And then these equations give you the jump equations, the same ones that I showed. And that's more powerful. Uh, okay, the latest interest in the field happens to be in the Messel scale. And we started in the 1940s uh, looking at the continuum viewpoint. Now there's new instruments that are observing what happens at the subgrain scale. This is new to the field. I mean, most of my work was done assuming continuum stuff. And when it wasn't, then I couldn't understand it, or neither could a lot of other people. But So a good example is the iron transition from body-centered cubic to hexagonal closed pack in polycrystal iron, showing that the, if you, the x-ray facilities showed that there's little platelets that form that go across the grains real fast, like sonic velocity, uh, that actually, that's how it transforms. And that's one thing that we, we weren't really sure how it did it, but we didn't know that it was doing it in platelets. Uh, but they actually, this, this paper here, actually shows that it, that is how it's done. Now, you could also, if you have, get selected, go to Chicago, the Argonne National Lab, and they have a gas gun uh, right on uh, their facility and so they have uh, x-ray diagnostics that, that are happening in submillimeter fractions. And so they allow some experiments, uh, and, and they, those are really uh, getting into the mesoscale field. And I'm not going to go too much over there. Um, I gave a talk at the APS uh, in Florida a year ago on air analysis. and so. Uh, I have to emphasize that if you're a scientist, you really need to know how to do air analysis if you publish. And I find a lot of people don't know how to do that. A lot of my students didn't know how. So I have to have one slide on air analysis. That's my point. <laughs> so, you know, precision is the measure of random errors. Experiment has small random errors. It has high precision. And uh, accuracy is when the experiment has small systematic non-independent errors. And systematic errors usually come from instrument uh, calibration errors. And, and so to, the final error in an experiment then has to combine both uh, the random and the systematic. And this is the final error in an experiment. You really do need to know how to add your error analysis if you're doing experiments. Uh, because that, that tells you just how accurate you are. And, and it turns out that uh, sometimes you get really surprised. Uh, if you want to really learn air analysis and you haven't uh, experienced that, this is the talk I gave at Florida. If, if it's on the website, at ETC's website, and it's an uh, hour on just shock physics and air analysis. So, and I, I know it's boring, but it really is important. <laughs> You know, it really is. So uh, I can't, I hesitated, but I did write a book. <laughs> it's here. <laughs> I get about $10 a book. <laughs> but anyhow, I spent three years doing this, and I think it's a pretty decent uh, coverage of, of the shockwave field. In fact, I wrote it because I didn't find any other text. Everyone else was too busy. So I retired and spent three years writing a book. And. And now I, I lecture. <laughs> so, all right. I have to end with something that uh, I hope you find is humorous. Uh, if you're an animal lover, you may not. So uh, I'm sorry about that. But this is one of my favorite things. And I hope you're not offended by it. Thank you. <laughs>